Hello gentlemen, welcome to our video on section 4.4 .4, entitled Reduction Oxidation Reactions. Now commonly referred to as redox reactions, reduction oxidation reactions are reactions in which electrons are transferred from one reactant to another. Now for this particular video in this particular section we're going to concentrate on redox reactions in the scope of single replacement reactions. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what redox actually means. So when an atom becomes positively charged, or we know that as losing electrons, it has been what we call oxidized. So a loss of an electron by a substance is called oxidation. And conversely, when an atom becomes negatively charged, it gains electrons. It has been reduced. And gaining an electron by a substance is called reduction. We can remember this by this mnemonic device here called oil rig. It's an acronym. Oil means oxidation is losing. Rig, R-I-G, means reduction is gaining. And of course we're talking about electrons, so use this to remember what the definition of oxidation and reduction are. Now, in lab we reacted, in our single replacement laboratory, we reacted magnesium metal with copper to chloride, an aqueous solution of it. And we created solid copper and an aqueous solution of magnesium chloride. Now during this reaction, it's important that we keep track of how electrons are being transferred between reactants and forming our products. We do that with something called oxidation numbers. So we keep track of what's being oxidized, what's you know, losing electrons, and what's being reduced, what's gaining electrons, by assigning different substances oxidation numbers, or you may hear it called oxidation states at times. Now here, here are some rules that govern what oxidation numbers are. Now I'm going to give you a copy of this in class. I'm not going to uh, read everything out right now but you will make yourself familiar with these when I give them out to you in class. Now in lab we had our magnesium metal being oxidized to form Mg2+. Here it's solid, over here it's in solution so it's floating around as Mg2+. Um, and this was oxidized by the copper 2 plus in solution here. So on the next slide here, we go through how to actually assign oxidation numbers or oxidation states for particular substances. I'm going to reference the rules down here as we go. So the oxidation state for magnesium is going to be zero. Why zero? Because of rule number one. Rule number one says that atoms in the elemental form have an oxidation number of zero. I mean, they're not bonded to anything, they're not ions, they don't have any real electron flow associated with them just yet, so it is just a zero there. Now for my next substance, copper 2 chloride. Now we handle each substance independently. So in copper 2 chloride, I have two things there. I have the copper and I have the chloride. I handle them differently when assigning oxidation states. So for example, copper. Copper is an aqueous solution here. So being an aqueous solution, my copper is going to be available as Cu2+. And I'm actually not going to write the entire Cu. I'm just going to write the, the state. So this charge would be plus 2 for copper. Because rule number two here says that monatomic ions have an oxidation number equal to their ionic charge. Since copper is copper 2 plus in solution, it has a plus 2 oxidation number. And Cl minus, so chlorine is in solution as Cl minus, but I have two of those ions, so it is going to be a 1 minus charge for chlorine, but I will have two of them, giving me overall a minus two charge for chlorines. And now I look at my products. Let's look at magnesium. Since that was the first one we did on this on the reactant side, let's look over here. Magnesium is an aqueous solution here with the chlorine. So magnesium exists as Mg2 plus. So per rule number two is going to have a, a oxidation state of plus two. And chlorine, the same thing as um, in the reactant side. It's still an aqueous solution, so it is going to 
have the one minus charge, but since there are two chlorines there given by my subscript two, I have a oxidation state of minus two. Now my copper here is elemental copper, and as an elemental substance, its oxidation state will be zero. Now we label these oxidation states and oxidation numbers to determine um, if something's been oxidized or um, reduced. Now, for magnesium, it went from zero to plus two. In order to go from something that's zero charge to a plus two charge, we know that electrons have to be lost. When electrons are lost, we call that oxidation. So magnesium was oxidized. Now if we look at my copper, copper went from a plus two to a zero. In order to go from a plus two charge to a zero, you had to have gained two negative things. So copper was reduced. It gained electrons. And this is why we call it a reduction oxidation reaction. This is these oxidation states are showing the transfer of electrons and how they're how they're happening. Now, if we look closely at chlorine, however, we started with a minus two, and we ended with a minus two oxidation state. So what that means for us, since chlorine has an oxidation number of minus two before and after the reaction, um, it has not been oxidized or reduced. So we call these chlorine ions spectator ions. They do not have a place in the reaction, really. They do not take place in uh, any chemical um, reactivity portions here in this reaction. So our equation that we had written before is called our molecular equation. This is just you know writing out the full equation as we have been in class. When we have spectator ions present, we do not write them when it comes to the important stuff, which is the net ionic equation. So this tells you how the ions are reacting and what the product is that is, you know, chemically relevant. See that the chlorine ions were just there kind of um, equating charge and solution, but they had nothing to do with the reaction, really. So your net ionic equation is magnesium as a solid reacts with copper 2 plus in solution, creating copper metal, and leaving behind magnesium 2 plus ions in solution. So how do we know that magnesium will be oxidized in this reaction, and how can we predict which metals will be oxidized in the future? I'm telling you that magnesium was oxidized by um, <clears throat> giving you this reaction, and we did it in laboratory, so we, we, we saw it happen with our own eyes. But how would I predict it before it was done? And secondly, why is this important? Um, this comes into play when, we, when it comes to storing certain materials. When we store certain um, solutions, we have to make sure that the metal container won't react with that solution. So for example, I couldn't store the copper chloride solution that we use in laboratory in a magnesium container because it would eat through the magnesium container. And I couldn't store, secondly, certain acids in different containers because acids can eat through those containers if we don't know how things react together. So take home message is this. Different metals vary in the ease with which they are oxidized. A list of mostly metals arranged in order of decreasing ease, ease excuse me, of oxidation is called the metal activity series. So here's the metal activity series. It's just a list of different metals, one of which not being a metal, hydrogen, that's why I say mostly metals, and they're arranged in order of their reactivity. Metals at the top mostly your alkaline metals and your alkaline earth metals are most easily oxidized. They react most readily to form compounds. They're very reactive. And metals towards the bottom here are very stable and you know they form compounds less readily. That's why we have things like you know gold and silver. These things make up a lot of the jewelry that we wear because they're unreactive. You wouldn't want to a reactive gold necklace, if it touched water or explodes or something like that, you wouldn't want that. So we use this activity series here to determine how things are going to react. Any metal on the list can be oxidized by the ions of elements below it. 
So let's take magnesium, for example. Magnesium is here. And copper is down here. Magnesium, since it's more reactive than copper, magnesium can come down and split up any union that copper has. Right now, copper has a union between the copper and the chloride here. Magnesium is more reactive, so it can come in here and kick out the copper, taking the place of the copper in solution, creating solid copper. Let's try this with a different reaction that's fresh. So here we have copper metal reacting with silver nitrate. Remember, usually we're going to have these spectator ions here. So the nitrate really doesn't matter here. We're just concerned about the metals. So if we look at our metals, we have copper, which is here, and we have silver, which is here. Copper is higher in the activity series, so it's more reactive than the silver, meaning copper will be able to come in and break up this union that, mag that sorry, that silver has with the nitrate. If it were the other way around, if I had pure silver and it was trying to break up copper nitrate, this would not happen. Silver cannot come up and break this union up. So you would have no reaction for this particular um, set of reactants. An oxidation of the copper to copper 2 plus here in this reaction above. I have copper going to copper 2 plus here in solution. Is accompanied by the reduction of silver ions to silver metal. Here I have silver ions and they're going to go to silver metal. You can't have oxidation without reduction. Now, gentlemen, I know that was a lot in a short amount of time, so please take notes. We're ready to talk about this stuff in class. Adios.